I am a neurosurgeon, and more specifically, I'm a functional neurosurgeon. Some of the main things that I treat are seizures. About uh, two-thirds of people who have seizures, uh, they can take a pill and it goes away. About one-third of people, that doesn't happen, and we look to see if there's a particular part of the brain causing the seizures. And if it's safe to do so, we can take that part of the brain out. I do surgery for movement disorders, so diseases such as Parkinson's disease or essential tremor, where people either move too much, like essential tremor, or Parkinson's disease where you move too little to a certain extent. You can implant certain devices that will provide electrical stimulation that then treats those symptoms. And there are certain types of pain that you can do surgery for that are treated very effectively. When I talk to people about what I do, I usually say this is a, you're operating on phenomena, phenomenology. So things that you see, behavior, um, abnormal behaviors, uh, as opposed to anatomic surgery, which most neurosurgery is looking for something that you see that's wrong on, a, on an image. So an MRI or a CT scan, uh, you could see a tumor, an aneurysm, some abnormal thing that's in the brain. The types of surgery I do, usually when you look at these scans, everything looks pretty normal. Um, and so you're actually operating on something that you see in their behavior, and that's what makes it functional neurosurgery. Most of these surgeries are not life-saving. If somebody says, no, I don't want a deep brain stimulator for my Parkinson's, if it would help them, you tell them, like, it would help you. Uh, you still have patients who say, oh, well, you know what, you're gonna drill a hole in my skull, that's, that's too much risk for me. Um, oh, well, you know, the complication rate is such and such, it's very low. The complication rate of you just having your Parkinson's is almost the same. You know, in terms of the number of times you go to the hospital because of your disease, with or without the surgery, it's gonna be about the same. With the surgery, your quality of life will be better, et cetera, et cetera. Some people just still say no, and you're not going to talk them into it. You're not going to say like, yeah, you need this. This procedure involves the placement of two leads, each with a number of electrical contacts at the business end, deep within the brain in an area known as the subthalamic nucleus. These leads are then connected via wires that run across my head and down my neck to a neurostimulator which is implanted in my chest. The neurostimulator is then programmed to deliver a small current to the brain to block signals from misbehaving neurons which are causing my symptoms. This is my therapy controller. It's like a remote control for my neurostimulator, which allows me to vary the voltage delivered to each of the leads in my brain within set parameters. There are randomized control trials, class one evidence that our neurosurgical interventions for these diseases are better than just medicine, or obviously not doing anything at all. For epilepsy, using you know seizure freedom rates, quality of life, return to work, psychological evaluations, all those things are better if you do a temporal lobectomy for mesial temporal sclerosis. The same with movement disorders, you know, for your Parkinson's patients. If you look at their motor outcomes, you look at their um, quality of life and level of daily activities, those assessments are all better if you do this surgery. Uh, and yes, you have the counterbalancing, yes, you have to go through surgery, you, it's expensive, et cetera, et cetera. At the same time, there's that discrepancy for what people expect to happen and what we expect to happen. And so when I talk to patients before these types of surgeries, my main goal is to try to get them to expect the same things that I expect. So they come in and they have, these are very disabling diseases, their lives are not good. Um, you make them better in some ways. Flushing display shows that my DBS is switched off. I'll switch it on by pressing the gray button again. Well, now you can see that the top line of my display shows that my DBS is switched on. Oh, I can feel the power come back on as a rush of electricity throughout my body and immediately my tremor is back under control. To do the epilepsy surgery you're still taking a part of the brain out. Do they have side effects from this? They can and some of them do notice. You know memory changes, some emotional mood changes, uh, but you warn them ahead of time. 
depending on the person, they come in and sometimes they'll say, you were right, these bad things have happened since surgery. And you're like, yes, well, we talked about this and you expected it, you're not surprised, you're actually not upset. So we're, we succeeded. But you know, success isn't just, oh, all good things. When I have a particularly complicated or big case or something like that, you know, the night before, I'll, I'll be dreaming about it. I still do this. I, I um, will be sort of mentally rehearsing and hope, you know, in terms of what is going to happen, um, which has absolutely no bearing on reality, right? You expect things to happen. You expect things to, to go in a certain sequence of events, but uh, it doesn't always happen that way. And it's not so much surprise, it's just that you, it, it didn't match the video in my head. You know, like the, there's, there's a video of how these go. You're gonna do this, you're gonna do this. There's parts where you're not sure what's gonna happen. Um, I mean, that's why you do the awake craniotomy. You're, if I could tell ahead of time where language was gonna be on the brain, we wouldn't do that, we would just avoid that part, right? So you're, what you're doing is you're looking for uh, the parts that you should not take out if you're taking out a tumor or if you're doing a seizure focused resection. You don't wanna take out that part because they'll have trouble talking, but you have to find that part. In training a lot of times, it's, you have this, when you're especially a more junior resident, you just wanna do things. You know, you wanna have the instrument in your hand, you wanna do the next move, and that's not actually the surgery. The surgery is, is building the video in your head. There's this book, Forgive and Remember. It's an anthropological study of surgical residency. It was done in the 70s at a very famous hospital in, in California. This anthropologist embedded himself in the residency program for two years and would just follow them around every day. So he would show up at five o'clock in the morning with them to round, go see all their patients. Some of his conclusions is that, you know, the, the, the surgical residency is not a technical training. It's a moral training. You can make mistakes. You can not know how to do things. You can be bad at doing things. So you can be a terrible technical surgeon, like, wow, you know what? This person just physically cannot do certain things. Um, so they're not going to do that type of surgery. Microsurgery is not for them. They'll do something else. That's okay. The things that will get you kicked out of our program, the times residents are fired is if they lie or sort of the inability to learn, <laughs> not or, or unwillingness. So carelessness, laziness, that those are the characteristics that will get you in trouble. I don't like that we give the impression that we fix things without cost with some of the Parkinson's patients. Yep, you know what, now I can, you know, walk almost normally compared to before when I, you know, I couldn't get through a doorway, but my speech is worse. Okay, well, we knew that this could happen. Neither one of us are surprised. That's kind of the, the mantra is like, no surprises, right? Neurosurgeons hate surprises. I don't want my patients to be surprised either, uh, but sometimes it does mean that, yes, this trade happened. Is it nice if you don't have some of these side effects? Yeah, because sometimes you don't have them. Having sort of a realistic response to what I do to me is in some ways better than the really good response that you can't explain. <laughs> Um, you know, you'll take it. You do, I think, pretty quickly address that doubt that, um, oh, am I ready for doing this? Can I do this? Is this the right thing to do? There's a certain inevitability. It, you know, it's not like you make something and then hope that people see it and tell you that it's good. You are in the situation, your patient's in the situation. There's an inevitability to the next part happening. So there, the imposter syndrome, the, the doubt, you know, there's, I think, a little bit more risk of that. You're, um, if you do have something bad happen, you know, you ask yourself more like, well, this person didn't need this and then it's supposed to make their life better. And because of X, Y, Z complication, um, it's worse or their path to getting to better was longer. In the end, what it does is it just makes you very um, obsessive about your way of doing it because this way is the way I've learned to try to minimize these problems. Three is the most important number in neurosurgery. So everything has a rule of threes. For epilepsy, two thirds of patients are not medically intractable. So you give them a pill, their seizures stop. One third isn't. And if you do an epilepsy surgery, a temporal lobe, there's three steps. You open, you take out the temporal lobe, you close. Each of those three steps has three steps. So opening, you open the scalp, you open the bone, you open the covering of the brain. Each of those has three steps. So if you're opening the scalp, you make your skin incision, you cut the temporalis muscle and you elevate the flap. That's 
how I think about almost anything that you do is you try to break it everything down so that um, when you're doing one thing, you know what the next step is going to be. Something that's helpful is that, you know, your training is a pretty long time, seven years after you've already completed graduate school. You do so much um, repetition of particular tasks that a lot of that uncertainty goes away. You know, the whole Malcolm Gladwell 10,000 hours thing. You know, I calculated back, oh, how many hours do I spend doing this? And you get pretty close by the time you finish training, which I think in his intended use of it. The training part doesn't even really count, right? It's the time that you're doing it. You know, you do these spine surgeries where the incision's this long. Um, it takes you a half hour, 45 minutes to close up all the layers, get the skin closed again. And I used to time myself. I would count how many stitches I put into each layer as you close. So I knew how long it took me to put a stitch in and tie the knots and all that. And I could tell, you know, for fascia, it's 15 seconds per stitch. I know it takes me 10 seconds to close an incision this long. Um, I know how many moves it takes, so when you do this, you pick one end up, you put the needle through, advance the needle, go to the other side, and it sounds kind of obsessive, compulsive, all that, but I like that, so that's a part of the drive. I know one colleague had somebody come in to film him doing surgery so that he could watch later and try to get rid of inefficient movements, but I think, again, if, if you're very good at something, I don't think that that's that unusual. I was a philosophy major in college and university, so you know, the philosophy of mind questions were always particularly, I guess they were particularly interesting and irritating to me at the same time. You know, the, the question like, okay, if you could duplicate your personality right now and transfer it to another body, which of those is you? It's like a ridiculous question to me, right? Um, and I think that was from before doing the neurosurgery. <laughs> that was just, some of these thought experiments make no sense. Why are we thinking about that? Um, and that's sort of the analytical, like Western European f philosophical stuff. Um, the more Eastern stuff, oh, reincarnation, like that we're not even gonna start with because that's a different question. I did a fair bit of, you know, the, the Foucault, Derrida, postmodern continental stuff where your notion of personal identity is a social construct predicated on maintaining the patriarch. Th those, those approaches are all, they just seem silly. Partially, you know, when you're working on somebody's brain, you can answer a lot of those, like, well, is, is your personality physical? Well, yes, because if I put this someplace, that personality is going to be gone. Um, that seems a pretty straightforward argument for like the physical nature of uh, the psyche. <laughs> and then it also kind of makes the whole like, well, if you could copy it onto a heart, it just, you know, we're so far from that. To get to that question about how has this impacted my, my conception of the psyche or the soul, um, I, I think on one hand it makes it more magical because look, we have you know, I can see the physical substrate of it. There's nothing special about it. It's yellowish. There's, it's very soft. <laughs> um, sometimes surprisingly resilient, other times surprisingly fragile. Um, but the physical makeup of, of, of what our, our experience of the world is, is, is I think uh, at this point to me, just somewhat unremarkable, right? It's. Uh, it's something you see every day. Um, on the other hand, that is what makes the outcomes sort of more magical. Like you, it's just this lump of stuff. And if I put a wire into this part of it, then this person goes from being a, not able to walk very well to walking up and down the sidewalk, jumping up and down, saying thank you, wow, look at what I can do now. Whereas before, and you, you know, you have you watch videos of some of these patients, and you just before and after, they're completely different. Um, and, and then you can actually see a difference in their, their personality, um, how they relate to the world. You, you see that difference, and that is kind of magical, whatever word you want to use. It's really boring, yet it's super interesting. You know, it's just a lump of tissue, but gosh, it's amazing. Maybe it's changed how I think about the soul or the psyche or whatever you want to call it, those words that you used. You know, on one hand, there's no soul. On the other hand, well, something is different. There's some emergent uh, characteristic of this that, 
that we can't explain. You know, people get really upset about that notion that like, oh, it's just a lump of thing. Like, gosh, how could that be? I am not just a... It doesn't change... I mean, thinking of your personality coming from your brain doesn't change what your personality is. Like, all, all the amazing things that you can come up with, why does it matter if it's coming from your soul versus it's coming from your brain? It's still an amazing thing. Um, and people, you know, again, like the philosophy, this is what... <laughs> That's why I left philosophy. Well, if, you know, 500 monkeys sat down at the typewriter randomly, someday they'll come up with Hamlet. It doesn't mean anything then, does it? I'd still think it would be amazing. Why would it be any less amazing? And I think when people think of, you know, consciousness, they want some magical meaning out of things that uh, I, I don't think it's there. You know, the John Searle Chinese room argument about whether or not meaning has to come from someplace else other than manipulation of symbols. You know, if you ever get to that point where these thought experiments are, are trying to describe, like, yeah, you have a manual that describes all the intricacies of the Chinese language, and then there's a natural speaker outside that can't tell the difference. Does that mean the man in the room speaks Chinese, or does it mean the room speaks Ch I'd say, yes, it does. Um, I know the intuition pump is trying to make you say, no, it doesn't. But to me, my intuition is, yes, it does, because I think that's how our brains work.